Hey Optomancers, Treant Monk here. So today we are going to be into week 8 of our series where we're doing 10 wizard builds, 10 different subclasses, 10 different concepts. Uh, today's concept and build is based on the Abjurer, and I'm calling this build the Armadillo because this build is all about building up the defense of the wizard. Uh, now this wizard is going to be able to go into melee, uh, but unlike our build last week, this build isn't about doing damage. This build is still going to be your standard wizard doing standard wizard kind of things, but we're also going to be looking for enemies to hit us uh, because that's how we're going to deliver damage to them. We're going to punish them whenever they hit us. And that is the concept for today's build, so let's get started. So in this video, uh, I'm going to be separating into three parts as per usual. Uh, on part one, we are going to discuss levels one through four. And then in part two, we're going to discuss levels five through 10. And then part three, we're going to discuss levels 11 through 20. Uh, so this is part one. You will find the links for part two and three in the comment section down below or in the video description. Uh, or if you just watch the end, there will be some links on the screen. So here we are on D&D Beyond. As you can see, I'm calling this build the Armadillo, uh, and I've turned off the homebrew content and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so when we go into race, I want to talk about race for a bit here. With this build, I went back and forth. Uh, I definitely considered going 20 straight wizard with this build, but one of the problems with going 20 straight levels of wizard with Abjur is that their arcane ward uh, works off of casting abjuration spells. And when we look at the wizard spell list, uh, there's not a whole lot of abjuration spells, uh, and there's certain levels where there's no good abjuration spells at all. Uh, and all the abjuration spells, pretty much, there's a notable exception at level 4, but pretty much all the abjuration spells are also circumstantial. I mean, shield is a great spell, I take it with every wizard but I'm only casting it when I'm attacked. So if I'm not attacked, I'm not casting shield. And that's a level one spell. Uh, when it comes to level two or three spells, there's just nothing there that I can count on casting a lot. So with this build, what we're going to do is we're going to dip into another class that is going to give us the ability to cast abjuration spells more with abandon. Uh, and it is also going to be a spell that works well at different levels and that kind of the build ends up kind of being built around that. Now the race I have selected is the Hobgoblin. Now if you are going to go 20 straight levels of wizard, Hobgoblin is by far, I think, the best choice for you. But with the dip I'm going to be doing, uh, Hobgoblin isn't necessary anymore. Uh, but Hobgoblin does provide a plus two bonus to constitution, plus one bonus to intelligence. Those are exactly where we want those bonuses to be. But we could do it with a variant human, we could do it with a regular human just fine. Uh, so it's not like Hobgoblin's your only choice here for this particular build. So as you can see, Constitution plus two, Intelligence plus one, these are precisely where I want them to be. We also get Dark Vision, a very common ability for races, but always good to have. Then we get Martial Training. It is proficiency in two martial weapons and your choice of light armor. Now, if we weren't going into uh, dip into another class, this would be pretty useful because then we would qualify for the moderately armored feet. And that's what you would do. If you do 20 levels of Abjur with a Hobgoblin, at level 4, you would get the moderately armored feet, get yourself in half plate and a shield as soon as you can, and that is really going to boost your AC. For us here, this is going to be a redundant ability. Uh, so we would choose two martial weapons. I would probably choose something like a rapier and a longbow. I'm not even going to bother here because, again, I'm going to get martial weapon proficiency regardless. The one reason why I stuck with Hobgoblin is for saving face. So Hobgoblins are careful not to show weakness in front of their allies for fear of losing status. If you miss with an attack roll or fail an ability check or saving throw, you can get a bonus to the roll equal to the number of allies you can see within 30 feet of you, maximum bonus plus 5. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a short 
or a long rest. So because you can do it every short rest, uh, this means we can do it multiple times a day. Uh, and when it comes to number of allies, uh, I would consider a standard party to be between four and five people. Uh, so we're probably pretty close to the maximum already. And then once we have a fine familiar, we're probably already at that plus five. But if we're not at that plus five, then there's other ways we can boost that. Uh, if we don't have any followers, if no one else has fine familiar, then we can do things ourselves. Like we could do something like uh, an animate dead or a summoning spell uh, to bring more allies on board so that we can make sure to get that plus five. Now the range of 30 feet is significant with this build because often with a wizard, we're going to hold back. Uh, with my standard god wizards, I would suggest being back from melee maybe less than 30 feet, but maybe more than 30 feet. And then you might end up in a situation where although you have five allies, they're not all within 30 feet of you. But this build isn't worried about hanging back. This build can go right into the center of the party, and if they get surrounded in combat, great. So the Hobgoblin here can really make use of saving face with this build. So this is why I'm sticking with the Hobgoblin, despite the fact that I'm not using martial training. So the class I'm actually going to start with is Warlock. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a level of Hexblade. So we begin with our proficiencies, and I'll just take Arcana and History. These are pretty standard wizard skills. Uh, and then Otherworldly Patron, I'm going to choose the Hexblade. So we're going to be making use of a lot of the Hexblade abilities, but not all of them. Uh, the first thing we get is Hex Warrior. This is going to give us uh, all of our martial weapon proficiencies and medium armor and shields. So that basically takes care of everything that the Hobgoblin got. Now a Hexblade also gets Hex Weapon where they can use the Charisma bonus uh, in place of their normal ability score bonus when using a martial weapon. That we're not going to use. This A lot of builds are built around that ability, uh, but those are Charisma based builds. We are making an intelligence-based build here, so we're not going to really get any use out of that. But medium armor and shields, we're going to get huge use out of. We also get Hexblade Curse. We can definitely use that. Starting at first level, you gain the ability to place a Baleful Curse on somebody. As a bonus action, choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. Target is cursed for one minute. The curse ends early if the target dies, or you die, or you are incapacitated. Until the curse ends, you gain the following benefits. You gain a bonus to damage rolls against the cursed target. The bonus equals your proficiency bonus. So this bonus here doesn't rely on you using weapons. You can do it with spells. So if you have a form of damage that does damage round by round, you can use your Hexblade Curse in addition to that so that you can add damage to it every round equal to your proficiency bonus. And of course, your proficiency bonus is not based on your charisma, so it's just as good with this character as it would be with a dedicated warlock. Any attack roll you make against the cursed target is a critical hit on a 19 or 20 on the d20. This one we're going to get a little bit uh, less out of because we're not going to be doing a lot of attack rolls with this character. Though, if we're going to attack with something like uh, Cantrip, for example, we would get that. And if the cursed target dies, you re regain hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. This one we're not going to get much out of. It's going to be a total of two points. We can't use this feature again until we get take a short or long rest. So once again, we have an ability because it comes back on a short rest, we can use it multiple times a day. So this is something we're going to throw on a really big bad enemy, one we expect to have lots of hit points, one we expect to take several rounds to take down. Uh, and that damage bonus, uh, where you're getting your proficiency bonus to damage, is a pretty big deal. So we need to set up our ability scores here, and a standard array with this character is going to work just fine. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a 13 in our Charisma, we're going to be taking a 10 in our Wisdom, an 8 in our Strength, uh, and then we can just put a 12 in our Constitution, that is going to become a 14, uh, and then I'm going to put a 14 in our Dexterity, and then a 15 in our Intelligence becomes a 16. If I was to do point by, it would be exactly the same. So that's why I'm using standard array here. This, there's no difference on this build between standard array and point by. To do our background, I'm just going to go ahead and just pick Sage. It's kind of a standard one for wizards, uh, and it works well here. We're gonna pick two skill proficiencies. Uh, as usual, I'm gonna pick perception. Uh, and then the other skill I'm gonna pick here is investigation. It's something that works off our intelligence, so we'll be pretty good at it. Uh, languages, 
going to be campaign dependent. I'm just going to take some standard languages. We'll take uh, Draconic and Elvish. Now going back into our class, we're going to pick some spells. Now keep in mind here we have a 13 Charisma and I always get somebody, I'm telling you, you do not want Eldritch Blast here. You do not want it. You will be so much better just taking an attack cantrip off your wizard list than you would ever be with Eldritch Blast. And you don't need to tell me that you're going to get additional Eldritch Blast at levels 5, 11, and 17, but your chance to hit is so bad that you aren't necessarily going to get any more hits than if you just attacked once with a wizard cantrip. So the spells I will take here are Booming Blade, which does not rely on a Charisma at all. And if we want to make a melee attack, and we're not going to make a lot of melee attacks with this character, but we might, because we are going to be in melee quite a bit. Uh, so if we want to make a melee attack, now we can do something a little more effective with it. Uh, and the second one I'm going to take is Mage Hand. It's a good cantrip, doesn't rely on our Charisma score at all. So then we're going to pick two first level spells from the Warlock list. Uh, now, you have a bit of flexibility here, but one that is an absolute must and that the, is just absolutely essential for the build is Armor of Agathis. If you don't take Armor of Agathis, there is no point in you going Warlock at all. And the second spell I'm going to take here, I'm probably not going to use a lot. I could take Shield here. Shield is a perfectly good option uh, because we are going to want Shield with this character. Uh, I'm probably not casting it very much at level 1, uh, but by level 2, we'll definitely be casting Shield. But I'm going to be getting shield through wizard anyway. Uh, so what I want to do here is grab something that the warlock has, that the wizard doesn't have, that I might use. Uh, now this does rely on charisma, so it is going to be a little less effective for us than it would be for a warlock. But I'm going to take hellish rebuke. So hellish rebuke, it's a reaction, and if you're hit with an attack, uh, you can have them make a dexterity saving throw, they take some fire damage, they take half if they save. So even if they save, at least they, there is an effect here. It seems like a weird pick, but it's going to fit with the theme of this character. So now we're going to choose our starting equipment, and honestly here what I would probably do is I would roll for gold, uh, because the Warlock equipment doesn't work at all with what this build is going to be able to do. You're going to get light armor, uh, you're not going to get a shield, you're not going to get a martial weapon, but I'm going to go ahead and just take the standard equipment anyway. Most of the stuff we need for this character isn't expensive, so we could expect that maybe at first level we're not going to have it, but as soon as we do an adventure or two and we get a few gold pieces, we should be able to equip ourselves pretty sufficiently for this character. So our starting equipment, we get a light crossbow, uh, we'll get a component pouch, I will definitely take a component pouch over an arcane focus because the component pouch is going to work for my wizard spells as well. Uh, I'm going to get a dungeoneer's pack, uh, and then leather armor, and then I get a simple weapon and two daggers. Uh, simple weapon I would take. Honestly, I'd probably take another light crossbow, and I'd sell it, because it's worth something at least. Uh, then I get a bottle of black ink, quill, small knife, letter from dead co colleague, common clothes, pouch containing 10 gold. So we'll add the starting equipment, but now I'm just going to let you know what you want to get for this character. The first item we're definitely going to want is scale mail armor. So this is a cheap armor, 50 gold pieces. Ideally, we actually want half plate armor. And uh, at some point, we'll want to upgrade to half plate armor. But uh, early on, 50 gold pieces isn't a big deal. So we should be able to get that in not too long with this character. And we'll want a shield. Now, we could potentially buy this right off the bat. It's only 10 gold pieces, and we're definitely going to want it for this character. Now, we're going to want a martial weapon for this character. I'd probably say your best bet is a rapier. Uh, it, it's not all that important. You could get by with something like a short sword as well. So at first level, uh, you might just want to rely on your crossbow, and then you could do something like your Hexblade Curse to boost the damage of it. Or if you can get yourself a shield and a decent set of armor, then you would have a pretty good armor class. Uh, this I put on the scale mail and the shield. We're looking at an armor class of 18. That's a good starting armor class for first level. Uh, so you could go in with your rapier at that point. And again, you would probably want to use your hexblade curse once in a while to increase the damage a little bit. The spell I would probably use with my single slot is Armor of Agathis. So what that will do is it is a one hour duration, non-concentration spell, and it gives you five temporary hit points. And whenever you are hit and you lose some of those temporary hit points, the opponent is going to take five points of cold damage. Now ideally, once in a while, you might be hit for less than five points of damage, and then you could potentially inflict those five points of damage more than once. 
Now we only get one slot with the first level Warlock, but we get it back on short rest. So ideally what we would do is we'd cast Armor of Agathis as we're going into adventuring. Uh, and then once we take a short rest, we'd cast again, so on and so forth. Uh, it very likely you'll take those five points of damage in between those rests regardless. But going into level two, now we're going to become a wizard. So we're going to get three cantrips at first level. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take Firebolt. That's going to give me a ranged attack. It's got a good range. As far as damage goes, it's about as good as you're going to get with a wizard. It's a D10 for scaling damage. Uh, and we have a good intelligence, so we have a decent chance to hit with it. It's not as good a ranged attack as any martial character could do with a ranged weapon. Uh, but for a wizard, it's about as much damage as you can expect from a cantrip. Speaking of can damaging cantrips, I'm also going to take Toll the Dead. Uh, so Toll the Dead works nicely in combination with Firebolt because Toll the Dead doesn't require an attack roll. Instead, they're going to make a saving throw. So it's good to use when we would have disadvantage, for example, within melee. Or maybe we're going up against a character that's hard to hit because they have a really good armor class. Toll the Dead 2 does reasonably good damage for a cantrip. It's D8 damage, but if they're damaged, and that's definitely who you want to target, whoever's damaged, then it's D12 damage, again, scaling with level. Toll the Dead's range is a lot less at 60 feet, but most combats you're still within 60 feet of the enemy. And then, of course, as usual, we'll pick up Minor Illusion. Note that both Firebolt and Toll the Dead will benefit in terms of if you cast them on somebody with a Hexblade Curse, you'll add your proficiency bonus to damage. However, Firebolt is the only one that will benefit from the critical range increasing from 19 to 20. So moving into our first level spells, we're going to begin with six first level spells in our spell book. Uh, of course, we can only prepare four of them. Uh, so the first one we're definitely going to want is Shield. Uh, so Shield is an abjuration spell that's going to benefit us later on. But with any wizard, I'm always going to pick Shield pretty much first. Uh, the only other spell that I generally consider a must for a first level wizard is Find Familiar, which I'm going to take as well. Because this character is an Abjurer and we're going to want Abjuration spells, I'm going to grab Absorb Elements, uh, which I would normally grab anyway. Uh, but I'm also going to grab the Alarm Ritual. Uh, is because the Alarm Ritual means that we can now cast Abjuration spells without using spell slots. Now I'm going to want a big gun spell. This is going to be a character who's going to have a good armor class, uh, can boost it even more with a shield, and will want to do so because that, of course, is going to eventually be of advantage to them as an abjurer. Uh, and so this big gun spell, I would think Thunderwave's a good choice because we're going to be right close anyways because Thunderwave originates from you. So my character's going to be right in the mix of things. Uh, so... Uh, Thunder Wave is something that they can use effectively. It doesn't hurt them to get in close, uh, and they can probably hit multiple enemies with it. Is the target of my Hexblade Curse, they'll take additional damage as well. And because there is automatic damage here, they automatically take additional damage. And then what I want to do is I want to give myself something as a ranged attack, uh, because most of my stuff is in close stuff right now, unless I use a cantrip. Uh, so I'm going to grab Ice Knife. Uh, so I haven't really taken Ice Knife before, uh, but as far as a ranged blast goes, uh, Ice Knife, Magic Missile, I'd say they're both reasonably good spells, uh, and they do slightly different things. Uh, so Ice Knife has a 60-foot range, uh, and then you create a shard of ice, fling it at one creature within range. Make a ranged spell attack against the target. On a hit, it takes 1d10 piercing damage. Hit or miss, the shard then explodes. Each target and each creature within 5 feet of it must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take 2d6 cold damage. So what happens is that your primary target can take 1d10 plus 2d6 damage, and those around it can take 2d6 damage. One thing I definitely like here is that because it is two different attack rolls, if the creature that you are targeting is the target of your Hexblade Curse, because we're making two different attack rolls, we're going to apply our Hexblade Curse bonus twice. Uh, also, we will get the advantage of the 19 or 20 critical range on the primary attack here. So that's our six spells, so let's prepare four of them, uh, which is easy to do. We're going to prepare our Absorb Elements, our Ice Knife, our Shield, and our Thunder Wave, and we're going to keep Alarm and Find Familiar for Rituals. So at second level, we've increased the offense, mainly of this character. We already had a pretty good defense right from level one, uh, though we did just add shield. So that 18 armor class, we can bump it to a 23 now. Uh, but we also now have some big gun spells. We have our ice knife and we have our thunder wave for either ranged area of effect or melee area of effect. 
Furthermore, now we have some attack cantrips. We have Firebolt for ranged attack or Toll the Dead for wherever, melee or ranged. So a pretty good selection of damaging spells there uh, that marry nicely with Hexblade Curse. So we now have a character that has a strong defense and a, an okay offense. We're not an offensive powerhouse, uh, but we have a number of options there. We're decent at range, we're decent in melee, uh, but we do have the restriction, of course, of not a lot of spell slots. So uh, just, I should mention this too, when we're talking about tactics and we're talking about using spells with a character that's multi-classed into Warlock, what you always want to do is uh, with multi-classing, I can use my Warlock spells with my Wizard slots, I can use my Wizard spells with my Warlock slots, uh, I always want to use the Warlock slot first because I can get it back on a short rest. So we're going to now become an Abjurer at level 3. Uh, so this is level 2 as a wizard. So what this gives us is the Arcane Ward. This is largely the reason why people like the Abjuration School. So Arcane Ward is a pretty big boost right at second level of Abjur. Starting at second level, you can weave magic around yourself for protection. When you cast an Abjuration spell of first level or higher, you can simultaneously use a strand of the spell's magic to create a magical ward on yourself that lasts until you finish a long rest. The ward has a hit point maximum equal to twice your wizard level plus your intelligence modifier. Whenever you take damage, the ward takes the damage instead. If this damage is reduced to zero hit points, you take any remaining damage. While the ward is at zero hit points, it can't absorb damage, but its magic remains. Whenever you cast an abjuration spell of first level or higher, the ward regains a number of hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. Once you create the ward, you can't create it again until you finish a long rest. So every time we take a long rest, we begin with this arcane ward that is going to be our twice our wizard level plus our intelligence modifier. So at this level, it is already seven points, and it is eventually going to be over 40 points. Uh, and this is not temporary hit points. This is not an increase to our hit point total. In fact, it's not hit points at all. Uh, it is instead of hit points. So it stacks with anything that increases our maximum hit points. It stacks with anything that gives us temporary hit points. And whenever we're hit, this is hit first before those temporary hit points or anything else are hit. But what happens is those seven hit points aren't going to last forever. Uh, so we definitely want to be casting abjuration spells as a way of bringing this back up. So we're going to grab two more first level spells. Uh, the first one I'm going to grab is Detect Magic. I think it's just a decent ritual for anyone to have. Uh, and then the second one I'm going to grab is Snare. So Snare is an abjuration spell. And that's why I'm going to grab it. I don't think it's a great spell. Uh, but I think it's okay in some circumstances. So it's worth having on our list just because we might cast it. And remember, when we cast it, we'll regenerate two hit points to our Arcane Ward. So this is an eight hour duration non-concentration spell. Uh, you, it takes a minute to cast, so this is not a combat spell. This is an out of combat spell. When you cast it, you use a rope to create a circle within a five foot radius on the ground or floor. When you finish casting, the rope disappears and the circle becomes a magical trap. The trap is nearly invisible, requiring an intelligence investigation check against your spell C DC to be discerned. The trap triggers when a small, medium, or large creature moves onto the ground or the floor in the spell's radius. The creature must see succeed on a dexterity saving throw or be magically hoisted in the air, leaving it hanging upside down three feet above the floor. The creature is restrained there until the spell ends. Restrained creature can make a dexterity saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. So this is basically if we know where a combat is going to occur uh, or we want to set up an ambush, we could use a snare. Uh, and because it has that long duration, there's a good chance that we could get an enemy caught in it and they're going to be restrained in the combat, and that can create a tactical advantage for us. Also, if I'm in a dungeon or something, uh, and maybe we're finding a room where we can take a short rest, and we know that there's the possibility of being attacked there, we might want to set the snare in front of the door or something like that as well, uh, and that could create a protection for us. So this is not a spell I would cast very often, uh, but we are looking for abjuration spells. There's no other first level spells that I require to have with this character. Uh, so I think this is a worthy addition because it gives us another abjuration option. So we'll prepare the snare, keep our detect magic as a ritual. Uh, now, when we have spell slots now, we're talking about three first level spell slots from wizard, one from warlock, 
And then if we take a short rest, we actually regain two spell slots because we regain both our arcane recovery as well as the pack magic. Pack magic we can actually regain more than once with a short rest. So this is a fair number of first level slots. So what we want to do is don't worry about using shield. Somebody attacks you, use shield. And use armor of Agathis. And when it goes down, cast it again. And we're not only going to get the five temporary hit points, but we're also going to recover two points to the arcane ward. So we're essentially getting seven additional hit points every time we cast it. So what that means is as a third level character, we have 22 hit points. But really, in reality, we have 29 just to begin with, but probably much, much more than 29. Because if we cast Armor of Agathis, let's say we cast it three times. Now that 29 becomes 44, except we're actually also recovering uh, six points off our Arcane Ward. Uh, so now we're probably talking closer to 50 hit points of damage that a third level character can take, and it's a Wizard Warlock. So I want to talk a little bit about Armor of Agathis. So Armor of Agathis or Agathis, depending how you like to pronounce it. I used to pronounce it Agathis, and people tell me it's Agathis, uh, though I've not found anywhere that they discuss the pronunciation of this word online. But So I'm going to try to call it Agathis, but if I call it Agathis, please forgive me. Uh, anyway, uh, Armor of Agathis, what it does is it's going to give us five temporary hit points. Anytime we are hit with a melee attack while we have these hit points, the creature takes five points of damage. I want to just mention how well this works with Arcane Ward, because Arcane Ward, of course, is going to go up with seven hit points. If somebody hits us, that Arcane Ward is hit first, before any of the temporary hit points of Armor of Agathis. So the Arcane Ward is hit, the creature still takes the damage from the Armor of Agathis, because we still have those hit points. So these two powers work really, really well together, and that's why I figure that this level of Hexblade with this build really works well uh, because we're going to cast the Armor of Agathis, we're going to have our Arcane Ward up, we're going to go into combat, and now we have 12 additional hit points, and until all 12 of them are gone, any creature that it hits us with the melee attack takes 5 points of damage. But that's not all. Uh, that's it for this level, but as we level up, and I'm probably going to refer to this again, uh, but as we level up, we can cast Armor of Agathis with higher level spell slots, and it scales really well. Uh, because every time we cast it with a higher level slot, we gain 5 additional temporary hit points and 5 additional points of damage to anyone who attacks us. And because we're casting it with a higher level slot, it's recovering more to our Arcane Ward, because we recover twice the spell level. So if we cast Armor of Agathis as a second level spell, it recovers 4 to the Arcane Ward. So suddenly now we're really boosting our arcane ward we're really boosting our temporary hit points it's going to be very hard to bring them both down and then they're taking 10 points of damage every time they hit us and so on as we get to third level spells and fourth level spells it just becomes more and more so it's going to scale with level just the way that enemies are going to scale with level as well so we're always going to be delivering significant damage with armor of agathis and we're always going to be getting a significant back to our arcane ward when we cast armor of agathis so this spell really becomes central to this character and when we talk about this character being an uncrackable nut this armadillo this is largely the combination i'm referring to is that we've just boosted our hit points tremendously uh, and we've boosted our arcane ward as well, so we're combining the two of them, and then we are punishing any enemy that attempts to bust their way through it. So what we end up with is a very unique situation. This is a wizard that actually wants to be attacked, because when we get attacked, we're probably got lots of hit points to suck it up, it is going to damage our enemies, and then it provides the opportunity for us to cast another armor of Agathis, and then recover the hit points and the arcane ward. So that has the effects of, number one, we can take it. Number two, it eats up enemy attacks. And number three, it provides us the ability to, to recover. And number four, they take damage from it. So this is kind of the perfect situation. Uh, so this is absolutely a wizard I want to throw right into melee. Now if I run out of spell slots, different. Now pull out. Uh, but certainly, as long as you've got spell slots, I think this wizard being in melee is the most effective thing they can do. So we're going to go to level 3. This will get us our second level spells. So the second level spells I want to take here, uh, I'm going to begin with web. 
uh, because, again, this is more of a standard wizard in terms of uh, our spells. We already have a number of damaging spells. Now I want some control spells. Uh, so web is a great control spell, and another great control spell is levitate. Uh, now, normally I would grab something defensive here, like mirror image or blur, uh, but this character, again, I kind of want them to attack me, and I want them to hit me. Now I might want to grab mirror image anyways, because it's a way of layering defenses, uh, but we'll look at that next level. For this level, web is a very good way for us to deal with multiple enemies, and then levitate is a good way. We can use it offensively to try to deal with one enemy. Uh, the chance of that working is so-so, but we can also use it to protect an ally, uh, because again, we want to be attacked. So we're up front, and the rogue's up front. And then now the rogue is getting attacked, and it's getting hurt. We can cast levitate on the rogue, get them out of danger, because the rogue is not moving out of their own accord, they will not provoke attacks of opportunity, and you can get them out of danger. Now the enemies kind of have to attack you. That is uh, the advantage of the levitate spell here. Or if we get in trouble, it's a way we can get out of danger as well. With that said, with second level slots, I absolutely think it's worthy to use Armor of Agathis with a second level slot, because it doubles its effect. Remember, with the Arcane Re Ward recovery, Armor of Agathis with a second level slot that's 14 hit points we're getting. And now that we have some concentration spells, I should mention as well, that because the Arcane Ward isn't hit points, and because taking damage to the ward isn't taking damage, uh, if you take damage to the ward, that doesn't count towards concentration saves. So if an attack hits you and it only damages the ward, you do not need to make a concentration save. And if it does penetrate the ward, only the damage that goes beyond the ward qualifies for determining the DC of the concentration save. We still have to worry about our concentration saves to some degree because we haven't boosted them in any way, uh, but we do have the Hobgoblin ability that can give us up to a plus five on a saving throw, uh, and that might be on a concentration saving throw, uh, especially at this level because we haven't really done anything to boost it. But in terms of spell casting, this character has definitely improved because we've added Levitate and Web, uh, and because we've doubled the effect of our Armor of Agathis if we cast it with a second level slot. Now I'm still going to cast it with a first level slot quite a bit because I have a lot more first level slots than I do second level slots. Second level slots, I only have two. But I can recover one with an Arcane Recovery, and that's probably what I would do instead of recovering two first level slots because I'm already recovering a first level slot uh, with my Pack Magic. So that is the Abjurer uh, from levels 1 through 4. So for the next part of this video, click the links in the video description or in the comment section down below. I hope to see you soon.